Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We saw last week that no matter who you are, if you are a believer, having received the gospel of Messiah, then the scripture says that you have been called specifically to the ministry of reconciliation. And what does that mean? Well, as we prayed earlier, we want to see all things brought under the lordship of our Lord and Savior, Messiah, that all things would be reconciled to him. Those things that are not, we know what their future, what their eternity is, and that is God's judgment, his destruction, his wrath. So knowing this, as we learned last week, we want to be heralds of that message of salvation. And it's through that message, that gospel, that reconciliation can come about. Now, here's the point for this week. Since we are ministers of reconciliation, what can we expect? What are we going to encounter when we live in obedience to that call, when we are faithful in this ministry of reconciliation? It might surprise you. And secondly, it's not what we're hearing much people speak about, teach about. In fact, we're going to be looking, I would invite you now to open up your Bibles and look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And, and my estimation is that this is probably a passage which is not familiar to most people. It is not one that is frequently taught and shared and studied. Why? because it may not be something that is pleasing to the, the individual, to their fleshly nature, to what they want to be. But this passage is a passage of truth. It speaks about a reality that believers will encounter. And we need to know these things so that we can expect these things so when they happen, that we're not surprised, that we're not confused, that we're not discouraged, but we know this is what God has promised that we're going to experience in this world as we seek to be ministers of reconciliation. So let's begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Now, the first word that we would translate is a word that shows a contrast. It's actually, when we look at verse 1, it's the second word in the text, but there are a few Greek words that never appear first. But when we render the translation, they must be rendered first. And this is a word of contrast. Why? Well, when we look at the last part of chapter 5, that last verse, it speaks about us and the righteousness of God that, that we become in him. So the key thought is righteousness, that which is pleasing, that which is proper, that which is in line with God's will. But what we're going to be talking about now is that when we are living righteously, don't expect it to make life easy. Don't expect things to go just right as they should. Why? There's going to be much opposition to righteousness in this world. See, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness. We all know the verse, Matthew chapter 6, where it says, Seek the kingdom of God first and its righteousness. So the kingdom of God and righteousness, they go together. But righteousness is not what describes this world. 
This world is a world of darkness, a world that's stained by sin. And remember, the prince of this age is the enemy, Hasatan, the devil. So righteousness is not what characterizes this world. And when we strive in obedience to promote, proclaim reconciliation to this world, there is going to be a response that more often than not is negative. Those who belong to this world are not going to want reconciliation to a holy, a righteous, a just, a perfect God. They're not interested in that. So he writes, in contrast to the righteousness of God, he says, but we, and it's speaking about us being workers, workers together, so working together and we exhort. This is word for encourage. We are working together and we encourage. And notice the first thing he says. He speaks about this concept of grace. And I think it's so appropriate, it's so timely today when people are confused concerning the grace of God. Most people do not know that the grace of God works in a person's life to produce the will of God. You say, well, I thought grace saves. Yes, it does. Through grace, one is saved, but we have been saved with a purpose, not to live in sin, not to practice unrighteousness we just saw. Those are in him are going to become the righteousness of God. And therefore, grace lives out. It produces righteousness in our life. And righteousness and the will of God go hand in hand. So Paul is speaking about him and those who are serving with him, his fellow apostle, uh, ambassadors and apostles. He says, but working together and we encourage, we exhort, not in vanity. And this is a word that has no, no proper purpose when we say something's in vain in vanity it has no good outcome it has a degree of that which is worthless not productive so he says i don't want that grace to be accepted in vain so he writes here we encourage that not in vanity the grace of god you received And the implication is that it wouldn't be in vain, but it would produce a mighty outcome, that there would be much fruit, much good work, much in regard to the will of God. This is what a believer has been transformed into, a vessel which is committed to the will of God. And this is seldom heard. We hear how God is going to help me, that God is going to bless me, that God is going to solve my problems, that God is going to give me the desires of my heart, that God is going to fulfill my destiny. That's what's popular today. But that message is misunderstood. It's misappropriated. It does not agree with what we see in the scripture. Now, does God help? Of course God helps. Will God move in my life to help me overcome problems and obstacles? Of course he will, but not so that I get what I want, but rather so that I become an instrument that that produces what God wants. Now, a mature believer, as we grow and mature, what we want and what God wants are going to be one and the same. That's when we pray, God, Give me the desires, your desires, for my heart. That's what we should be doing, that our heart, our desires, our wants are exactly what God desires. That is spiritual maturity. But look again. He says, but working together, and we encourage that that not in vain the grace of God you have received. He's speaking here that there's an opportunity now. Notice the next verse. Look at verse 2. 
For he says, and this is a quotation from the book of Isaiah in chapter 49. And one of the things that I would advise you to do is to read Isaiah 49. It is an awesome chapter about God's redemption and the significant place that Israel has in God's plan, that Israel is God's vessel to bring about change. What type of change? A kingdom change. Now, remember where we are. We are in Corinth. This is Paul's second epistle to the congregation at Corinth. And I shared with you in our study of of both the first and second epistle to the Corinthians that there was a significant Jewish community there. And apparently Paul is encouraging them. We know, in fact, if you go to Corinth, there is there a, a sign, one that's carved into stone concerning a synagogue for the Hebrews. So it was a place that has proof, not by just assuming or or thinking, but their historical evidence that Corinth had a significant Jewish community. So Paul is speaking, he's quoting from Isaiah 49, a very well-known chapter by the Jewish community. He's putting things in their terms. They would have known the content of this 49th chapter. And the quotation where it says, for he says, this is the Lord, an acceptable time. And this word for accepting is also a word for welcoming something. It's accepting it not because there's no other alternative. This is what I get, so I might as well be happy with it because there's nothing else. This is not what this word means. It's accepting something, welcoming it, because it's exactly what you have hoped for. It's what you have desired. What Paul is saying here is that you have a wonderful spiritual opportunity, that you are living in a significant time. Now, this was true because the gospel was going forth. This wasn't true 100 years earlier, 500 years. It never been true. But now, for the first time, that gospel message is going out, not only out within the land of Israel, but outside of Israel to what we see here, to Europe, to Greece, to the city Corinth. So once more, for he says, in quoting Isaiah, an acceptable time, I have heard you. God, the people have been lifting up prayer over and over for this time of redemption. And Paul is saying, in quoting Isaiah chapter 49, where God says, this is the acceptable time which I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. So two things, God has heard and he has responded. Now he's been hearing, God always hears. But now he's responding to this, these petitions for redemption, and he has helped the people. How? Through the work of Messiah. This is this generation, the first generation that has opportunity outside of Israel to respond to this, this message of salvation. So he says, In this acceptable time, I have heard you, and in this day of, and don't miss this word, salvation. Salvation is a kingdom word. It's a kingdom invitation today, today of salvation. I have helped you. Behold, and always whenever we see this word, behold, whether it's in the Old Testament or New Testament, there is always, always something very significant. So we read here, behold, now is, and there's a change. He takes that same word for acceptable, that which is welcoming to us. And what does it say? He adds to it a a prefix, literally two prefixes, that speaks about good. It's an well-pleasing. 
It's an acceptable time that is good and pleasing. So he emphasizes what he has just said. And now it is a pleasing, a well-pleasing time. Behold, the second time the word behold appears, now is the day of salvation. So there's an invitation to respond. God has acted now. Are we going to be faithful to respond and participate in in behaving in the way based upon how God is moving? This has a great spiritual implication to us. See, if we're going to be successful servants of God, if we're going to do things that are pleasing to God, we have to know what God's up to. Where is he moving? What is he doing? Why is he doing these things? And then come along aside and be what we saw in the very first word of, of chapter 6, this word for working together. In fact, some translations add, but it helps us understand when Paul says working together, Primarily, it's just not us working with one another, but primarily, it's us working with him. That's the implication. So now we want to discern what God's up to, the significant time. Now, 2,000 years ago, there was significance because the gospel was beginning to touch nations. I would share with you that that time for the gospel to go forth to the nations is coming towards an end. God, and I think we can see this, God is turning his attention back to Israel. Now, if you are prophetically wise, you know something. You see an increase in anti-Semitic behavior. If you are listening to the news, we are seeing more and more, for example, in Europe, in South America, in North America, we are seeing vandalism. Vandalism in synagogues, vandalism in Jewish cemeteries, vandalism in Jewish institutions. And much of it has a Nazi-centered message. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is this. God is beginning to turn back his attention to Israel. And whenever God moves, you can be assured that the enemy is going to respond in a hateful and disobedient way. Now you say, well, what was it 80 years ago during the Holocaust, that time that brought about that awful Holocaust? Well, God was moving to bring the people back to the land. He was moving for the establishment of the nation of Israel. And that's why Satan raised his ugly head. That's why we see so much anti-Semitic behavior, atrocity, pogroms, horrible things against the Jewish people because God was moving to make a large step forward in the prophetic calendar by restoring the nation of Israel. And in that same way, we're seeing once again a rise in anti-Semitism because God once more is turning his attention, and I believe for the purpose of the last days. And what is that going to bring about? Well, God's moving in the last days towards the Jewish people to reconcile, remember the context, a ministry of reconciliation. It is going to bring about a time of trouble for Jacob. So we're dealing with things that have very significant spiritual implications. Look again, God says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Verse verse 3. It's very important that we live beyond reproach. Very significant that we live in a way that does not discredit our, our faith, that we don't have some something that is unseemly, un, unbecoming, that which takes away from the, the relationship that we have, that we profess, that we testify of to others. 
And that's why Paul uses some very strong language in verse 3. He says, nothing by no one. Now, this is simply, in the Greek language, the way of saying, I don't want anyone by anything to do something. And what is that? Well, let's just translate it very literally. Nothing by no one giving offense. That can be a stumbling block, giving offense in order that the ministry, that the ministry would be, would be stained. This is a word for, for having some blemish, some mark that's unseemly upon it. So he says, nothing by no one, that there should be a spot, a blemish upon the ministry. He's telling us how important it is for us who are servants of God to live beyond reproach. Give no evil appearance of anything. But, notice what he says, but in all things, all behaviors, in all things, commending ourselves as ministers of God. Now, that word minister relates to being a representative to or for and the purpose is the work of god being a representative of god's work what he's about so once again it all goes back to us having discernment knowing what god's will is knowing what god's up to and participating with him and what a privilege it is to come alongside and serve God, to be allowed to participate in the things of God. This is a great blessing, and it is a great source of joy for a person's life. No matter what that role is, no matter what he has for you, if you do it, it is going to be a sense of joy. You are going to have a feeling of, of completion, of 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 doing what you're supposed to be doing. Even though it might seem insignificant or insignificant to the world, you are going to see, and especially from a kingdom perspective, that thing which you may have thought, it's not all that important, it can have great consequences eternally. Now, we're getting into the next section of, of this chapter, and we're going to see that God tells us, he gives us a list, a long list of what we can expect. And I just want to pause for a moment and have, your, have yourselves ask yourselves a question. And that is, is this something that we're hearing frequently today? See, I look at, at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and I see great prophetic significance. I see Paul laying out things that have great relevance, not just for his days when the gospel was first going forward, but for our days and perhaps the time of the Gentiles, that time of the gospel going forth is coming towards an end. Now we know, let me give you a scripture, Matthew 24, verse 14. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, we are told, before the end comes, and this is the end of the church age. Before that end comes, the gospel will go forth to all nations, the gospel of the kingdom, to all nations as a testimony unto them. When that happens, the end comes, the end of the church age. And if you're wise and you read Matthew 24, you're going to see that the next thing is that there's an emphasis on Israel and the Jewish people. Paul is saying here, this is what a servant, a minister, an ambassador of the kingdom should expect. This is the, the job that we're saying yes to. When we receive salvation, this is what we can expect. This is what we are agreeing to. Look again. He says, in order that we would commend ourselves as, as ministers of God. And he says, look in the middle of verse 4. In endurance or 
perseverance. Now, some may say patience, but this is the word for, for enduring something, persevering. The word patience, for example, in Hebrew, the word savlanut comes from the word for suffering. So it's suffering stretched out. But this is the, simply the word for enduring, perseverance. And usually, endurance and perseverance is never in regard to something that is joyful, pleasurable, a source of happiness and such. We don't endure that. We relish that. It's always those good times seem to, to end too soon. So we're dealing with the context here is those things that are difficult. And he's going to tell us that in no uncertain terms. So look again, middle of verse 4. Commending, this means showing ourselves to be ministers of God. How do we do this? In what we experience. In much endurance or much perseverance and then notice the next word it is in tribulation now this is something that we see constantly throughout the word of god when that word tribulation appears more often than not it's in regard to those who are believers he's telling us here as we submit to this call to be ministers of reconciliation, ministers of God, submitting to the purpose, the plan, the will of God, we are going to encounter tribulation. That's why in the book of Acts and chapter 14 and verse 22, we read that it's necessary. This is a word which means it's an absolute necessity. It must be. So it says it's necessary for, for us believers to encounter much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. So you can be assured that we, not encountering the wrath of God, but there's going to be much tribulation. And this means persecution, opposition. So he says, there's going to be much perseverance in tribulation in, and this next word, to do a good study of it, it has to do with that which is necessary. And these are the things that, that faith compels us to do. They are essential. So we're going to be in tribulation doing the things which are essential for us to do. We are going to persevere in tribulation to accomplish these essential things. And realize that these essential things are going to be met with much opposition from the enemy. And that's why the next word is in, and this is a word for distress. Now, here again, this word speaks of not just minor suffering, but intense suffering. We know, for example, medically. If a patient becomes in distress, it's not just saying they're suffering, but, but they're in a life-threatening situation, and action must be taken. And so we're going to find ourselves in life-threatening situations. Action must be taken if we're going to, to overcome that. And that action is going to be by means of the Holy Spirit. So he says here that we have to have much endurance because we're going to be finding ourselves in much tribulation, doing the essential things, the things that we are compelled to do, and this is all going to lead to much distress. And then in the next verse, verse 5, he's going to tell us, what type of situations that we're going to find ourselves in for our faith? Now, I realize, I believe not only did this have great significance and, and relevance and very practical going back in the time of Paul's life, but also in the future, what we can shortly see. And by the way, what we see happening in other places. In, in largely Muslim, Islamic countries, if you're a believer, you're going to be experiencing this now. 
in places of communism. For example, places like China, other places that have dictators and tyrants, those that deny human rights. We see that, that one of the first groups that is gone after are believers. Why? Because we are about justice and righteousness. We don't like oppression. We don't like injustice. And therefore, we are going to be seen as enemies, as deplorables, as obstacles to their objectives. And that's why he says, look at verse 5, also in, and this word means, some Bibles may translate it, stripes, blows, it has to do with being physically, physically harmed. It has to do with a form of torture, physical, physical pain that comes from receiving blows of some type. So in blows, in prison, in riots, these are uprisings. Get ready for this. This is what's going to be happening to believers. We're going to be tortured. We're going to be thrown into prisons. And there's going to be riots. And we're going to be toiling. That means serving in labor. And this next one is a word for a night watch. Now, I realize that some Bibles may translate it sleeplessness. But what it is is a night watch. And probably what it's referring to is this word has to do with someone guarding the city, watchman on the walls. But here it's prayer because something is of great significance. For example, I think about when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12, and it says the congregation, they were assembled and they prayed. Prayer was offered up continuously for him. Acts chapter 12. That's what we're referring to. There's going to be dire situations where true believers are going to realize, no, we, we can't sleep tonight. We are compelled to stay up and offer prayer. These night watch watches for, for things. And also, notice how verse 6 ends, also in fastings. Meaning not just fasting once in a while, but fastings in the plural meaning abundantly. So think about what this verse said. Because of our faith, because we're ministers of righteousness, being given a ministry of reconciliation, we are going to be beaten in prisons. We are going to be in riots. We're going to be laboring. We're going to be having those night watches, and we're going to be fasting, verse 6. But in doing so, how do we conduct ourselves? Notice it says, in and some of the translation changes all these words that i've said in tribulation in long suffering and it's a greek word n which we get the word in from now for some reason many translation although it's the same word translate it render it differently that says by perhaps but it's the same word in purity, in knowledge, in long suffering. This is this word to suffer long. In kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. Now, I read these quickly. We're going to go through them again. But they're very, this verse speaks of different things. How we meet those unpleasant things. And how do we do so? Well, we do so. When we're beaten in prison, all this suffering that we're going through, we meet it. We don't change. We stay in purity. We stay with that same knowledge of the Word of God. We don't change our perspective. And once again, we, we suffer long, but nevertheless, we do so in kindness, and all of this is in or by the Holy Spirit, in, and here's the key, genuine love. Now, this genuine love, I believe that there's another Hebraic nuance here, because 
if you come from a Jewish perspective, having been, been reared, grown up in, in Judaism, when you hear love, you know what comes into your mind first? The Shema, and that verse that follows it, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, the very essence of the person. So love is connected to the law, the love of God, and because I love God, that love of God that I have is going to manifest itself with loving my neighbor as myself. So the love of God produces love for others. And when it speaks about genuine love, it's speaking about the love that the Torah expresses. So we love God, and that love of God is going to manifest itself by loving others. And that's why we are going to be individuals that are pure, act in the knowledge of the truth. We're going to suffer it long. We're going to be in kindness, and we're going to be operating by means of the Holy Spirit demonstrating, and here it is, genuine love. Verse 7. And all of this is held together because of a commitment. Notice verse 7. In the word of truth. What is the motivation of all of our thoughts, all of our actions, is scriptural truth. And that's why it is so disturbing that the word of God is under attack. Now, if you've noticed... There just seems to be just constantly new translations coming from, for, for the Word of God. And I would suggest to you that the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of these new translations, they, they are not at all accurate. And they, they try to camouflage it by saying dynamic equivalency. What that means is, well, we're not translating it literal, but we're going to try to give you a dynamic, a a wonderful, you know, equivalent in, in our language, in our thoughts, in our mindset, what we believe it to mean. In other words, their so called translation is coming with an interpretation, and usually those who are making the interpretation are coming from poor theology. They have an agenda that is not in keeping with the truth of God. So he says here, in the word of truth, and when we're walking in the truth, we can also be expecting to be in the power of God. These things go hand in hand in the truth of the word and in the power of God. And then there's a change in the middle of verse 7. It changes from the word en to the word dia in Greek, which is through. So these things that we've been talking about that we're in, now we're in them by means of through the, and some Bibles will say armor, but it's really not the word armor. It's it's more correct to translate this word for weapons. Now, here's what I'm talking about, is that that armor is more of a defensive uh, uh, apparatus. It defends us against the attack of the enemy. This is not what this is speaking about. This is speaking about the weapons. So the weapons, now, armor is part of the, the, the supplies that a soldier has. But this is dealing with all of them. It's a word, a very broad word for weapons. So we have here the weapons of righteousness. And what Paul is referring to is this. When I have, and pay close attention to this, when I have as my objective righteousness, that's what I'm concerned with. I want righteousness when I and concerned with that. And all of my words, all of my actions are for the purpose of righteousness, the righteousness of God. God is going to supply me this weapon, whatever I need, 
to overcome the attacks, overcome the, the battles that the enemy is placing upon me. So he writes here, look very carefully. He says, and the weapons, through the weapons of righteousness, of the right hands and of the left hands, meaning this, this is an idiom, right and left in all situations, at all places. This works always. When you are committed to righteousness, God is going to supply you the weapons to defeat the enemy. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what time, what culture, none of those things are, are relevant for this. God will be faithful to equip us with the weapons in order to defeat the enemy for righteousness to be manifested now look if you would to to verse to verse 8 where it says through and the word doxe doxe like doxology is a word for glory or honor so here again righteousness produces that which is glorious that which brings honor to god and not not that which is, and it's a different word. Some say honor and dishonor, but it's not the word for honor and then the word for dishonor. It's the word for honor or glory and the word for that which has no value. So he says that which is weighty, that which is of glory, and that which has no value whatsoever. Then he says through, through a bad word, or a good word. What he's saying here is this, regardless, and hear this carefully, regardless of the accusations, regardless of what's said, regardless of whether someone says this behavior is glorious or this behavior is valueless, we don't take our marching orders from the world. We don't do what society wants us. We don't pay attention to society standards. That's what he's telling us here. Whether the world thinks it's glorious or of little value makes no difference. Whether they give us a good report or a bad report makes no difference. Whether they say that, that we are deceivers, he says, but, but yet we are true. This is the point. We don't listen to what the enemy says concerning us because we are of the truth. Be prepared for something. Because of the word of God, because of what we say, we are going to be attacked. We are going to be called bigots because we stand against homosexuality. We are going to be called narrow-minded and other derogatory terms because we, we speak against just this rebelliousness against God, saying that, oh, this person was born a man, but, but he's really a woman and, and so forth. There's a host of things that we're going to say no to. This is not truth. This is not righteousness. This is wrong. And we're going to be attacked and we're going to be labeled. Here it's saying, that they're going to call us deceivers, but we're actually operating in the truth. Don't worry about what people are saying about you. That's what he's talking about. Look at verse 9. As unknown, the world's not going to know us, or we may be recognized. Makes no difference. Whether we are known or unknown, whether people recognize us or don't recognize us, whether they recognize us as something which is proper or something that's improper, it makes no difference. As, as dying, some will be put to death. But behold, we live. Meaning this, just because we are put to death doesn't mean that we are not alive. Dying for your faith, you're going to see dying for your faith. You will never be more alive, more aware of life. I'm speaking about not physical life, but the life, true life that God imparts to us. So he says, whether dying but, behold, we are alive. 
He says, as discipline or being chastened and not, and not killed. We may be disciplined, but it's not over. It's not the end for us. This is what this idea of being killed has to do with. Being grieved, but always. There's things that are going to be making us full of sorrow. But he says, look at verse 10, our last verse. Being grieved or being made of sorrow, but always. I would underline that word, always rejoicing. As poor ones, but making wealthy many. What's he talking about here? Well, he's saying physically, looking at our bank accounts, looking at our, our financial resources, there's going to be coming a time when our faith is going to make us poor. We're going to lose the right to utilize assets, earn money, all these things. We are going to be poor ones, but in the midst of our activity, we're going to be making others wealthy. Here again, not talking about fin financially wealthy, but kingdom wealthy in the promises, the blessings of God that one will receive in the kingdom of God. And then finally he says, as not having, but he says, all things possessing. Why? Well, very simply, we may be those that are rejected from this world. We might suffer a loss of all things in this world. The world might look to us and say, you have nothing. But we have inherited the kingdom of God. And if you possess the kingdom of God, if you're there in the very presence of God and God is well pleased with you, don't you have everything? Everything that's of an eternal value, a kingdom value, if you're there, it's yours. So a very different perspective than what we hear oftentimes concerning our call, our call to be servants of the living God and what we should expect that we're going to encounter as we faithfully live out this ministry of reconciliation, walking in truth, doing the things, doing the things that God has called us to do for the sake of righteousness. I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.